Thank you, Travis. Hope not to embarrass us. Uh, I've enjoyed uh, the past couple of days very much uh, getting to meet some of the alumni that I didn't know uh, very well before and uh, all the sessions, hearing about things that I need to improve on myself. I appreciate that very much. I am glad to be able to talk about Bible classes. I run the Bible class uh, program at Florence Boulevard, and the elders asked me a few years ago to design sort of a curriculum for that, and I was blessed to be able to do that. And so uh, I think about Bible classes quite a bit. Most of the Bible classes I go to are really excellent. Who knows why? Because I'm, I'm the one teaching, yes, right? <laughs> so I tell people, you know, every Bible class that, uh, that I teach is really good. You know, every other one is, you know, that's, that needs improvement. Now, that's the way I look at it. And then uh, do you know that at Florence Boulevard there are actually people who choose to go to different Bible classes that I'm not teaching? I mean, can you believe that? It's true. People actually choose different teachers. What makes a great sermon. You've, been in, you've set through great sermons before, yes? You've been in there and the, maybe you've preached some, I hope. But you've listened to one. Imagine yourself listening to a great sermon and you are captivated and convicted and you leave thinking about that all day, if not all week. It just plays in your mind. Maybe you think about it for the rest of the year, this sermon that has been preached. What made that sermon so good? Several things. Okay, so we have several things. Let's move on. <laughs> what, yeah, what, what? Say that again? Preparation. Okay, preparation made it good. Presentation. It was relevant. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, preacher man. Yeah. Uh, pertinence. Passion. Passion. Boy, you don't even have to try, do you? <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, have you sat in a Bible class that was really good, just like that sermon? Like one session? We think. Can you think about a Bible class that was like, Wow, that was a fantastic Bible class. Was it this, is it the same? The same stuff makes it good. Think about the, um, the great um, Bible teachers that you know in churches. Think back about where you can identify maybe before you became a full-time preacher if you don't get to sit in Bible classes very much these days, or maybe, maybe you do. And you can think about, that guy knows how to lead an adult Bible class. That is a really good Bible class teacher. What is it that makes the Bible class good? Think about that and think about what is the difference between a good Bible class and a good sermon? Is there a difference between a good Bible class and a good sermon? Is there a difference between a Bible class and a sermon? I have been asking people several times over the past few days, uh, what is it makes a good Bible class? Every single person says interaction. Interaction. You have to have interaction to have a good Bible class. In a sermon, you don't really get that. We know that Peter got it in Acts chapter 2, but you know, we usually don't. Uh, so interaction. Um, what else? Okay, the student desires to be there. Your class will be won't be what you expect it to be because there's several people that really are there because they feel like they have to be. Okay. Okay, so if the students are already have the desire to be there, that's certainly helpful. Yeah. Yes. Okay, controlled interaction, I think we know what you mean by that, but tell me, uh, define. Okay. Okay, you, you should have some goals in the Bible class session, 
we need to get somewhere, so don't let them wander off. Uh, in regard to interaction, um, you know, the, I think that uh, there are a couple of don'ts there, right? Have, uh, oh, did you have something, Dale? Was that your hand? Yeah, I'm Oh, you wanted, yeah. Okay, a couple of don'ts would be don't lecture, right? As far as, uh, it's not a sermon. It is different from a sermon. You do encourage interaction. So I have said in quite a number of uh, Bible classes where, uh, you know, it was basically a lecture. Now, it was a lecture punctuated every once in a while by, does anybody have any questions? Well, I must be doing a good job. Nobody's having it. Nobody has any questions. <laughs> that is not the mark of a good job. Uh, all right. Uh, so don't, don't say that. Uh, and then the, the other uh, one is, uh, let's read the text. How does that make you feel? Oh, yeah. Who else? Who else wants to share how they feel about that? Okay, that's, that is uh, the non-controlled thing. Uh, it's, it's not helpful, right? There is no insight into the biblical. Rarely is there insight uh, when, we, when we do that. There's no learning involved. Okay, Dale. Yeah, that's a couple of excellent points there. One is that the teacher needs to have a knowledge of the student uh, or the, the class that he's in to be able to make those connections. And then another one was that not all great Bible class teachers are great preachers, and I think the corollary is not all great preachers are great Bible class teachers. Um, you know, I think I've experienced some really good preachers who make okay Bible class teachers and vice versa would be the case as well. So uh, there are several things we can think about that makes a good Bible class. I would say that some, you know, it's the case sometimes a sermon can just boom, hit you right between the eyes sometimes or step on your toes or whatever metaphor you want to apply to that and you leave thinking about that for a week. I don't know that one Bible class session, the way that we have described it, usually you're going to get that result. A lot of times, at least from my experience, when I think about great Bible class teachers, it's not because they have that ability in 30 minutes in a Bible class with interaction and all the things we've been talking about that it's just going to hit you one time. What it seems to me that makes that person a really good Bible class teacher is that over 13 weeks or six months or however long the class is divided in, you can look back and say, man, I have learned a lot about that book that I had no idea about. And not only have I learned a lot about that particular book of the Bible I'm talking about, but I also see how it's relevant to me and the church. And so it's not so much the instant impact from my perspective, not so much the instant impact that a sermon can be. Sometimes you have that in a Bible class, but most of the time it's that sustained going through the biblical text, teaching that uh, makes an impact on people over the long haul. Would you say that is a fair assessment? So if that's the case, sermons and Bible classes are really somewhat different. And we can think about them having different goals, perhaps. Uh, when you preach, what's the goal? To get a positive response, yeah. You can say that with a lot of things. Uh, when you uh, wait tables or, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, to get a positive response, okay. Action. Okay. You're going you're gonna to say, take the biblical text, um, interpret it, and then bring it 
to today, and this is what you need to do as a result of what we've talked about. That's what, that's what Dale likes to do, and if Dale wants to do that, we all should uh, in our preaching. Uh, can, is it different for Bible classes? In my perspective, it might be. Um, I'm not sure that every Bible class, well, I know that this is not particularly the case for the ones I teach, but I'm not sure that it's, it's uh, ideal that every Bible class needs to be focused on application. I think a lot of times Bible classes, especially when we're getting into the unfamiliar parts of the word, we need to just figure out what is the book of Chronicles doing in the Bible? What is it? You know, and that might take more than actually 30 minutes. That might take three or four weeks to figure out what is this thing and what is it doing here. Over the course of a quarter, I would say that application definitely comes up. But at least for me, I don't make it my goal that every Bible class session must uh, result in, now what, do we, what am I going to do this week with the result of this knowledge? I think sermons need that. I'm not sure that every Bible class session needs that. Maybe you disagree, but do um, you have any comments or? Yeah. Ah, yes. Should enrich you in some way. And I would say knowledge is a part of that. Yeah. Okay, yes. You should be able to leave that Bible class being able to point to something and say, that is significant addition to my life, whether it is knowledge or an application or something else. Yeah, I would agree with that. But I don't think that's part of Bible class, too. Uh, you may be enriched by the relationships you build because you hear someone's comment and then you talk after and spark a friendship, deepen a friendship. Yeah, so there are this goal of Bible class community building, we might say, that uh, we like that goal of Bible class as well. And that's certainly the case with, which I would add, can only be the case if there's interaction. Uh, you know, it, which is why sometimes you know, we, we think of that as the goal of Bible class, whereas it's not particularly the goal of a sermon because there's not really the uh, interaction involved in that. But in a Bible class, you have that interaction. And so community building would be um, also a goal of a Bible class. Well, uh, so we've already talked about several things that I think are helpful on a practical level. Um, for um, Bible classes in general. Interaction, we talked about already, and how everyone seems to think that needs to be in a Bible class, and I would agree with that. How do you achieve interaction? Asking questions. Asking questions. Um, I, I feel pretty successful already uh, this morning in achieving interaction. <laughs> Uh, because I, that's what I've been doing. Now, um, <laughs> let's plan it safe. Yeah, <laughs> ask questions you already know the answer to. Um, right. Who died on the cross for our sins? Okay, I got an answer quicker than I expected. Because a lot of times you'll, answer, you'll ask those questions, let's say in the auditorium class where, what is it, you go to die, right? Uh, the old people go there. Um, and that's, I teach that class a lot. Um, or even, I mean, younger than that. You ask, you ask a question like that, and what do you hear? Crickets, right? Snoring, snoring. well, s snoring, okay. <laughs> well, I, th yeah, sometimes they're afraid whatever answer is the wrong answer, but that question, I think, is too obvious, right? I think sometimes questions are too obvious, and so we, um, we need to ask thought-provoking questions, leading questions, open-ended questions. You know, sometimes, que you know, you sit in a, a class, I've been there, you've been there, where the teacher asks the question that's like, who died on the cross for our sins, and nobody says anything. It's not because we're all idiots. It's because we're thinking, why in the world is he asking a question like that? I don't want to say it. You want to say it? You know? Yeah. <laughs> they don't know anything. Yeah, that's right. That's the impression we get. And I did a great job because nobody asked me a question, and they don't know anything. 
So, so we have to ask the right kind of questions, right? Uh, we have to think about it beforehand. I, I think part of that is, I mean, sometimes you can do that just off the cuff. Sometimes you need to be thinking about, I'm going to ask this question, and that, that's going to be a good question to uh, elicit responses. You have to think about that beforehand. You've got to prepare your questions, not just your content of your lesson that you want to get to, but the questions that you're going to ask. And be open to a variety of responses. Right? And be okay when somebody says something that is uh, maybe not what you were thinking. But, you know, it takes some, I think, uh, skill and experience to be able to work that into, yeah, that's good. Let's, and that's uh, actually what I was thinking about over here. And, you know, sort of tie that in. Yeah, Keith. Yeah. 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 So teachers are afraid of silence. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think I've, uh, you know, not to say I'm the greatest teacher in the world, but I, I have developed to the point where I really do wait on that answer. You know, and if it's if it's Usually I'm not asking, I try not to ask those obvious questions, but if I'm asking a little bit harder or one you have to think about, I, I, I am content to wait on the response um, until somebody finally says something. <laughs> so yeah, that's good. Good. Don't be afraid to wait. Uh, you know, silence on TV is a killer, but we're not on TV usually, especially our Bible classes. So. Yes, Corey. One thing that will help do that is a willingness to quote me on the subject. That is, go somewhere where you uh, did not necessarily intend to go if the passage that you're studying uh, sort of suggests that subject. And uh, someone brings it up, and, and then you can talk about something that's really interesting to them, whether or not it was interesting to you. Yeah, that's a good thought. I mean, Sometimes classes do have really good questions uh, that need to be addressed because a lot of people have those uh, questions as well. And it takes some uh, wisdom, I guess, to know when you're going to get too far off topic about something that really doesn't need to be addressed in this setting and when you're going to usefully address something that, even though it's not what you prepared, is something that everybody wonders about. And so you're going to go ahead and and talk about it. So the willingness to do that in the appropriate circumstances is a good thing. Yes? And in that same thought process, I think, uh, as teachers, we have to be careful, or preachers, uh, of not shutting people down when they've not said it in, quote, the right manner or something, but to you know, be a good listener. It's like your kids coming home from school and telling you something that you really, it sort of grates on you to hear, but you got to go ahead and listen because then guide the situation, not shut people down. Because if, as a uh, preacher or a teacher, if you are typically shutting people down before they get it out, uh, that comes from being a good listener sometimes. Uh, they'll quit asking because they don't want to be shut down. Yes, I hear what you are saying and I affirm it. Yes, <laughs> I'm not going to shut you down. Yeah. Yes. Mm. They look at, I, I'm not looked up as a superior, I'm seen as an equal, and they're more comfortable to talk about. You want the common folk to see you as an equal? Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. I guess that works for you, but. <laughs> I'm Dr. Gallagher. <laughs> <All right. laughs>
All right. Well, uh, you know, in a room full of preachers, you guys like to talk, uh, I've noticed. Uh, that, that's one difference uh, about teaching this group than, uh, than the, my typical congregation setting. Um, a couple other things about, well, one, one other thing that, uh, that is useful to consider when, when thinking about the difference between a sermon and a Bible class, not only do we want to encourage that interaction and perhaps the goal might be different in a Bible class than in a sermon, but also the age range is usually limited in a Bible class setting, and that might allow, that should allow, for maybe more candid discussions of perhaps even some sensitive topics or some topics relevant to a particular age range that might not be uh, relevant to uh, others. Uh, so, you know, that is useful to consider in um, Bible class preparation as well. The number one answer I got over the past few days is I asked people, what makes a good Bible class? Interaction, definitely, interaction. Another answer that came up that I would like to think about is teaching unfamiliar texts. I understand uh, the previous uh, session um, talked about teaching the 66, teaching all 66 books of the Bible. I was teaching a university course at the time, so I didn't get to come in here and, and listen to that. But sometimes uh, that's more effectively done in a Bible class than in a sermon. Teaching unfamiliar texts. This Sunday, I start uh, a class, adult Bible class, teaching the book of Chronicles. 13 weeks on Chronicles. I don't know that I've ever been in a class on Chronicles, I've been in classes on David, usually focused on Samuel Kings, you know, Samuel. I've been in, you know, History of Israel classes, usually focused on Samuel Kings. I don't know that I've ever been in a class on Chronicles. I've certainly never taught a Bible class on Chronicles. So it just happened that this came up, and so um, we needed somebody to teach it, and I get the, I'm the one picked for that. Um, I told you I'm in charge of it, so, you know, I, I picked myself. <laughs> I picked myself. Um, nobody else wanted to do it. <clears throat> this uh, Wednesday, a week uh, coming up, I'll start teaching Isaiah in a quarter, a quarter on Isaiah, to uh, the college students. So, you know, uh, I've done quarter-length studies on Deuteronomy. Uh, you know, coming up in the fall is a quarter-length study on Ezekiel. Uh, for the Sunday morning auditorium class. We do uh, the curriculum that we go by at Florence Boulevard. It takes us through the entire Bible, and so Ezekiel is going to come up. It is actually in the Bible. I don't know if you've checked recently, but it's there. And so we're in a Bible class, and it's going to come up. You know, so, so some of the responses were, I, I don't want to study Acts every quarter. You know, it's a great book. I would like to, I would like to study something else. Um, so, you know, Ezekiel is there. You might consider studying that. So, what I want to uh, spend, I guess, the rest of the time on is uh, thinking about that. Being open to the voice of God in Scripture, in all of Scripture. I taught a class already on Isaiah a couple of years ago. Uh, the auditorium class. We pick on the auditorium class a lot, but, you know, it's fun too. Um, I was in the auditorium teaching a quarter-length class on Isaiah. I was doing the first session. And, you know, Isaiah is a pretty big book in the Bible. You know how many chapters are in Isaiah? 66 chapters. Maybe that's one of those two obvious questions. I don't know. Maybe it's not. It's a big book. It's, is it ever quoted in the New Testament? Anybody know? It's actually quoted quite a bit, right? I mean, it's all over the time. Is Isaiah important for Jesus? Is Isaiah important for Paul? Wow, you know, this is an important book in the New Testament. I'm pointing some of these things out in this first session of a quarter on Isaiah. I was talking about the historical context. Anybody know how to, f how to find out when Isaiah prophesied? Where, where do you go? Any prophet, you want to know when they worked, where do you go? <laughs> exactly. 
Yeah, yeah. The deterioration of Bible knowledge in our culture. A preacher says Google. My goodness. The internal evidence? Where? Where is it internal to the book? First verse. Okay. Yeah, the first verse. You just turn to the first verse. And if you want to know when a prophet prophesied, usually. Jonah's not that way, you know. But usually you turn to the first verse. So I'm going through the first verse. This king and this king. This, who are these kings that Isaiah worked under? Okay. Auditorium class, you know. So the old man... Why are we studying the book of Isaiah? And I didn't cut him off at that point. I was hearing uh, what he had to say. You know? <laughs> I didn't say preach on, but, uh, but he, he did. So, you know, um, isn't this irrelevant? Shouldn't we be studying out of the New Testament? I mean, this was, uh, these are real comments that somebody actually made. You know, why are we studying the Old Testament? Uh, and so I was thankful that immediately, I didn't say a word, immediately four people jumped up. I mean, they didn't even keep their seats. They stood up and said, we need to be studying this because the Old Testament's important and Isaiah, you know, all this stuff. I mean, they, they, were, uh, they were offended. I think they were offended because they recognized that this is a common, you know, pervasive viewpoint. And so they, they wanted to cut it off immediately. They wanted to make sure that this is we all know this is important, and it's not just me saying it, but they're saying it as well. Well, study unfamiliar texts. Um, the Old Testament is an important part of Scripture. There are a lot of unfamiliar texts in the Old Testament. Be open to the voice of God in those texts. Why is it that we just don't cut it out? You know, if we're not going to teach Ezekiel in church, why don't we just, you know, take scissors and rip it out? I didn't say it to this gentleman, you know, why don't we just cut Isaiah out of the Bible if we shouldn't study it, but I think that's the necessary implication. You ever heard that phrase? I think that's the necessary implication, necessary inference of, uh, of his the view. Why don't we just take it out? Why don't we take Leviticus out of the Bible? It's scripture. That's why we don't. It's the canon. It's our, the word of God for us. That's why we don't take it out of the Bible. It's the word of God. So let's teach it to the people of God. Be open to the voice of God in all of Scripture, all 66. In Chronicles, God speaks to his people. In Lamentations, God speaks to his people. In Zechariah, God speaks to his people. In Revelation, God speaks to his people. Now, he probably doesn't speak over a five-year span, so cut it down. You know, when you teach Revelation, you know, get it in, you know, a quarter, two quarters is, is enough. Don't drag it out, you know. Been in some churches, you know, we're on two years in, in Revelation, and we're at the, you know, chapter four. Isn't that great? We're really digging into the words. Like, well, there are other parts of Scripture, you know, uh, not just Revelation. But be open to the voice of God in all of Scripture. Sometimes we read it and we just don't see it. Yes? My name tag. Travis, I found my name tag. Yesterday, Travis got up before and after Dale spoke and said, remember your bag and get your name tag. And at lunch, I came to Travis and I said, well, I don't see my bag. It's not there. I, I don't have a name tag. And he said, well, it should be there. Last night, we came to get steak. And I saw this thing hanging on my door, my door handle. Did you put that there? Yes. When? Days ago. Days ago. I, I go to conferences a lot, and every, at every conference you go to, you get a lanyard with your, your name on it. Well, there was one particular conference I wanted to remember. I had been to that conference, and so I kept my lanyard and my name tag, and I hung it on the inside door knob inside my office. One day this week, days ago, whenever it was, I saw this name tag hanging on the outside doorknob of my office, and I thought, huh, well, that's weird. I wonder how it got outside. I guess somebody broke into my office and, you know, I didn't really think about it. I just thought, well, that's weird. I, I thought I hung that on the inside. It's been hung on the inside for two years now. Somehow it got on the outside. I don't know. I moved on, didn't think about it whatsoever. I saw it. I didn't see it, right, until finally last night I came and I saw the, it just, I saw the picture and boom, there's my name tag. 
<laughs> what was I thinking? You know, uh, so I put it on. Okay. I saw it, but I didn't see it. Sometimes we approach Scripture that way, yes? We read it, and we read it, and, you know, it just doesn't, it doesn't speak to us. We're not looking for it. When I started looking for my name tag, all of a sudden I saw it. Be open to the voice of God, even in those parts that you think, well, this, this is irrelevant to the church. You know, the church doesn't really need to hear about leprosy in, in Leviticus. 13 to 15, that's, uh, those are the irrelevant parts. I challenge you, I'm not going to give you an application of Leviticus 13 to 15, but you come up with one. Teach those parts. That might work better in a Bible class than in a sermon. People will like it. They want to be challenged with these unfamiliar texts, with meaning that they haven't seen before. How do, you, how do you hear the voice of God in all of Scripture? Well, one, read Scripture, right? Just read Scripture a lot and be looking for it. Be looking for God speaking to his people today in Scripture. Train yourself to read Scripture in this way. Read good books. I've been attending some of the sessions, and I um, hear authors that I don't know. I actually... I feel embarrassed by this, but uh, I heard Andy Stanley's name 15 times yesterday, so I Googled him. Who in the world is Andy Stanley? Well, I th I'm not a, I'm not a, I don't preach um, very often. I enjoy preaching, but uh, I don't, I don't know a whole lot about big time preachers. I, I now realize he's a big time preacher. He has written some books apparently, and so, so okay, Andy Stanley. Well, you're already reading, uh, and. Uh, I had a friend named Mandy Stanley when I was, I was like, is it the same? Is it? No, it's completely different. Um, but you're already reading good books, so uh, continue doing that. And let me just give you one recommendation that you might not be familiar with. I subscribe to books and culture. I don't know if some of you might subscribe to this. It's fantastic. It's uh, written by, uh, or it's... Uh, published by the Christianity Today people. So it's evangelical, broadly conceived. Uh, but it's approaching books and culture from an evangelical perspective. It's book reviews, it's essays on culture. And so I learn a lot about books from reading this, sometimes enough that I don't actually have to read the book, which I'm always thankful for. But that's something that helps me in getting broader than my own context. I, I read a lot of scholarship, and usually when scholarly things come out on things that I'm interested in, I already know about that. But this is reviewing things that are helpful for the church, uh, and so I want to know about these things, and this is the way I find out about them. So I would recommend that to you if you are interested in that. Read good books. Sometimes they open your eyes to things you haven't seen before. Well, like I say, I read scholarship quite a bit, so let me end with maybe a couple of... Uh, illustrations on seeing the voice of God in Scripture in maybe ways that you haven't before, seeing texts in a new way. I read scholarship, enjoy that. You know, I find that to be a spiritual experience myself. Reading scholarly works on the Bible helps me spiritually. I was reading Michael Fox's commentary on Proverbs in the Anchor Bible series. It is the best commentary on Proverbs I can even imagine. So it is certainly the best one available. I can't even imagine a better one being written. Michael Fox's Anchor Bible on Proverbs is just fantastic. Two volume job, just finally published in 2009, the second volume. That helped me see Proverbs in a new way. I sometimes go to churches and ask, uh, what is the easiest book in the Bible to understand? And sometimes, when they are doing what I want them to do, they say, the book of Proverbs. All you have to do is read it, and it's straight off, and that's, that's all. Now, implementing it is sometimes, you know, it's different, but actually understanding it, I mean, how can you not understand the Proverbs? What Michael Fox helped me see is that the Proverbs are actually a little more complicated than sometimes we think. And that the fact, have you noticed this? The Proverbs are all two lines. It's poetry, right? You know, the Proverbs are written in poetry. Now, what's interesting about that is that we have, in English, a lot of Proverbs. Haste makes waste, 
early bird gets the worm, such like. Most of our proverbs in English are not two lines. Most of them are one line. I got five minutes. You look in the Bible, outside the book of Proverbs, for Proverbs, 1 Samuel 10, 12, is Saul also among the prophets? It's called a proverb, right? Is Saul also among the prophets? 1 Samuel 24, 13, I think, out of the wicked comes forth wickedness. It's called a proverb explicitly in the text. You look outside the book of Proverbs for things that are called Proverbs, and they're one line. What's interesting about the book of Proverbs, over and over and over again for how many, how many chapters? 30, 31 minus 9 is, what is that? 22? 22 chapters. Did you know the Proverbs in the book of Proverbs start at chapter 10? They don't start at chapter 1? I'll, okay, that's, I didn't. They start at chapter 10. The first nine chapters are all poems. They're not Proverbs, they're all poems. You get to chapter 10, and over and over and over again, you get these two-line Proverbs, two-line Proverbs. It's unusual. It's weird. Why do we get two-line Proverbs? And what Michael Fox helped me to see is that these are training us in thinking like a sage. Because you read the first line, and that says its job, and sometimes we stop, right? Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Stop. As if that were the whole proverb. You've got to read the second line. Fools despise, what is it? Something. <laughs> what is it? Instruction. Instruction. Yeah, I can't get my words right, but <laughs> fools despise something is the second line. You got to read. The, it's a two-line job. You read the first line, and that's easy to understand. You read the second line, and that's easy to understand. But putting them together is the job of thinking like a sage. How does this relate to that? Sometimes it's pretty obvious. Proverbs 10.1 about, you know, a, a wise son makes a father glad. A foolish son gives, is a grief to his mother. You know, it's, it's a little more complicated than we usually think, but that's pretty obvious. Sometimes it's just bizarre, and you really have to work. How is this line related to that line? And when you get there, you are thinking like a sage. The book of Proverbs not only gives you sage advice, it trains you in how to think like a sage. Michael Fox helped me see the book of Proverbs in a new way. Congregations enjoy hearing that because it gives them a new way to look at the book of Proverbs as well. One other example. Uh, I was talking to another scholar, Jeremy Barrier, one of our own. Just a brief conversation. And he said um, something about Yodi and Syntyche, the fight they were having in Philippi. And all of a sudden, you know, that, that experience where, boom, whoa, Yodi and Syntyche were fighting in Philippi. Was that a big fight? Or is it a big deal in Philippi that Yodi and Syntyche were fighting? You know, Philippians 4.2 is what I'm talking about. Was that a big fight? How do we know it was a big fight? Somehow, not, not only, somehow it got from Philippi to wherever Paul was, probably, maybe Rome. Somebody thought, I better go there and tell him these two women are in a fight. But Paul, even in a public letter where he addresses, what, the elders and deacons in the first verse, right? He mentions this fight. Now, he didn't spend the entire letter talking about the fight, except that I think he probably spent the entire letter talking about the fight. You know, that's one of those instances where it's like, wow, he's been talking about this the entire time, and finally, at the end of the letter, he actually names names. All right, just one example, because my time is up, but chapter 2. Why does, why does Paul tell us about Jesus? Is it because he wants to teach us about Christology? Well, sort of, but it's more because he wants us to be like Jesus, right? He emptied himself. He emptied himself. You also work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Empty yourself. Who is he talking to? I think he's talking to Yodi and Syntyche. He's talking to the people. Is it just Yodi and Syntyche fighting? No. Right? You know how these fights work, right? People line up behind them and say, I'm on her side, I'm on her side. You know, they've got their husbands involved. They've got factions in the church. It's a big deal. Empty yourself. Empty 
yourself. What does Paul go on to say? I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith. What is Paul saying? I am emptying myself. Do like I am doing. Empty yourself. I have all these things in chapter 3 that I could brag about. I count them as rubbish. You've got all these things that you're, I'm right and I'm right and you're in this fight. Empty yourself. Just like Jesus. He's not telling us just so we would know more about Jesus. He's telling us so that we would imitate him. The voice of God in Scripture, I think that is what congregations need to hear. And maybe that text of Philippians, you know, we think about it as the epistle of joy, and that's what Paul wants to emphasize is joy, 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 joy. Well, that's in there. I don't want to deny that 16 times. You know that. But I think it's also when we see it with fresh eyes, an epistle of sacrifice, self-sacrifice, where Paul is calling on the church Imitate Christ. Stop your foolish fighting. Be like your Savior. We worship a Lord who sacrificed himself. You do likewise. We see the text with fresh eyes and we can bless the church in fresh ways. So, hopefully you've gotten something out of uh, this session about how to improve Bible classes, but especially hearing the voice of God in Scripture and teaching that. Thank you.